Good morning. Welcome to the Minnehaha County Commission meeting for July 2nd, 2024. I'm going to call our meeting to order and note for the record that we have a quorum of all the county commissioners present. Um, before we start, if you have one of these, you might want to silence it. It's embarrassing when it goes off. Um, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. There's no sound out the extra room. We can't hear will get. We will address that. All right, I'm going to look for a motion to amend our agenda. Commissioner Bender. Uh, Commissioner Karski, I'd like to make a motion to amend the proposed agenda by adding an item to regular business immediately before item nine to be titled Disaster Declaration Resolution. Um, as background, uh, yesterday we were informed that enough individuals in the county had reported flood-related property damage to the state to warrant a request for a presidential disaster declaration for individual assistance. Therefore, the resolution is necessary for FEMA to begin their assessment process as Jason Gearman um, will point out during his presentation, passage of the resolution does not guarantee federal relief. I'll second that motion. Okay, motion and a second. All those in favor of amending the agenda say aye. 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 Oh, same sign, motion carries. And then look for a motion to approve our amended agenda. That is my motion. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Oh, same sign, motion carries. Consent agenda, our consent agenda is our bills that we pay, our personnel actions, um, property tax exemptions, et cetera. Is anybody from the public that would like to address any item on our consent agenda? All right, any commissioner like to remove any item from our consent agenda? Look for a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Please call the roll. Kipley? Aye. Benega? Aye. Blindberg? Aye. Bender? Aye. Kersky? Aye. Motion carries. All right, moving on to our uh, FEMA amended agenda where we are going to um, discuss the FEMA resolution. Is Jason here? Ah, there he is. Come on in, Jason. No need to read the resolution if you just want to kind of um, describe it. It is available for the public if they want to read the entire resolution, but thank you. Thanks, I appreciate that. Uh, Jason Gearman, Minneapolis County Emergency Manager. I also have Regan Smith here if you guys have any questions specifically to what's going on in the city with the damage assessments. Um, the original plan was to do this on the 16th um, with, the, with the damage assessments ongoing. However, uh, late yesterday I was contacted by the state. Late yesterday I was contacted by the state um, that we had to speed up our timeline a bit uh, due to the individual assistance that uh, came out over the weekend. Uh, apparently there was a, um, some kind of press release and over the weekend people must have found time to submit their damage to the state, which is a new online, they have a new online site that people are able to submit the damage to their houses. So that's kind of what sped up the timeline and they had scheduled FEMA to come in the week of the 16th, so uh, our resolution would have been too late. So this resolution uh, basically states that, um, you know, we would like to declare a disaster for Minneapolis County. Um, no guarantee that there will be any funding, um, especially for the, for the, for the homeowners. Uh, we'd like to say there would be, but um, sometimes what happens um, doesn't really necessarily uh, bring out the funding um, and then we are we may be a little short on fun, on the uh, the threshold for the public damage assessment but we're still that is still ongoing right now so again why I'm here today is to to uh, ask your approval for the disaster declaration all righty anybody from the public like to comment on the disaster declaration Thank you. All righty. Uh, technology, got to love it. Um, commission, action, questions? Uh, 
Commissioner Bender? I think since Reagan was kind enough to join us this morning that I think people would be interested if you'd be willing to come forward and just give a little update on what's going on in the city. I was just going to go there. Thank you, Commissioner. Good morning, Regan. Commissioners, uh, Regan Smith, Emergency Manager, City of Sioux Falls. Um, yes, uh, we definitely had an impact over the uh, the flash flooding over the last uh, few weeks. Uh, the city did issue a state of emergency that allowed us to procure uh, contracted uh, storm stormwater pumping. Our primary impacts were uh, to the park and recreational system, to our sanitary system was was very strained. Uh, we had to do quite a bit of pumping and uh, equalization there. Our storm uh, drainage system was also impacted, a lot of pumping there, um, and also some minor repairs to the levy. Uh, we're, as, as Jason said, we're going through that damage assessment process at this point. Um, it's still early in that. We're not seeing the, the infrastructure uh, er, er, in our damages that we saw in 2019. So we'll, we'll continue to go, go through that, but would again uh, support this, uh, this declaration so we can go through that process and, and make sure that uh, we, we uh, capture all that and then move forward if, if there is enough damage. Any questions? I guess I have one, Regan. Yeah. I'm just kind of out of the, an idea of the scope of the water coming through the sanitary system. On a normal day, what's processed and what was happening? Sure, yeah. sure. On, on a normal day, about 19 million gallons are being uh, processed through our sanitary system. And at one, at one point, uh, there were about 80 million gallons coming in. Uh, we were able to process 43 million of that and capture about another 30 million in some equalization basins that we've uh, recently constructed uh, down by the street department. So, so probably three to four times normal. And about so six million went into the river. Then is that? Uh, I, I'm not sure of that number at this okay. point. Okay, that's a lot of water. Okay. All right. Need a motion to approve this uh, resolution. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Call the roll. Kipley. Aye. Benega. Aye. Bender. Aye. Weinberg. Aye. Karski. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, auditor's briefing on the June 4th primary election recount and post-election audit. Auditor Anderson, good morning. Good morning. Um, at some point, I just want to let Trish know, I may need to use the Elmo, so. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, so the purpose of my briefing this morning is to um, give you an update on the recount, which occurred on Monday, the 24th of June, and then um, I will break once I talk about the recount and see if you have questions, and then we'll move on to the post-election audit. Um, so there were three candidates that were on the ballot um, for the June primary, 2024 primary, and they successful, three that su successfully petitioned for a recount um, of their respective races. The recount was held on Monday, June 24th. Um, the board convened at 9 a.m. and adjourned, <clears throat> adjourned at about 7.30 p.m. The recount process involved the three board members, um, about eight full-time staff from our office, two seasonal um, election workers that I still have on for a couple more weeks, and myself. Um, Present for most of the day were several candidates and their representatives, a few media outlets, and also several people from the public. Um, the recount board was very careful in looking through the ballots for missing ballot stamps prior to tabulation. They also hand counted the commissioner contest in precinct 26 to verify results. Their count was the same as the machine tabulation and uh, for that contest in that precinct. The contests that were included in the recount were the Republican state representative for District 11, the Republican county commissioner at large, and the Republican precinct 2-3 uh, committee man. So in summary, the recount board removed three express vote ballots that were missing a ballot stamp 
and added 132 ballots uh, from those that were previously rejected by the precinct board. Um, also, if we scroll down here, I have, um, I put in an insert of what those results looked like from the original canvas, the recount canvas, and then the differences. You'll notice the differences for the county commissioner at large had to do with those 132 ballots. Not all of those were Republican ballots. Some of those were Democratic ballots. Um, since we re-ran the whole entire um, county ballots and those ballots were inje injected back into the count, um, the ones that were previously rejected, the, also the Democratic presidential race was impacted by that. And so we ended up with new official results when we went into the post-election audit the next day. So I'll pause there and see if you have any questions. All right, we're gonna take these as two separate items on our agenda. Um, so this is the recount. Um, any public comment on the recount? Before we, I'd have one question for the auditor just for clarification on the recount. We, we commented that uh, there were 132 ballots that came back in, I think that was from uh, a, a difference in the decision at the precinct board level of 416, precinct 416 to the recount board. Would you say going into November, does that have precedential value to you and your office uh, when we're at, on the day of November 5th? Do we have any assurances for those voters in 416 that they'll be able to vote or will that be challenged again? Um, I can't tell you whether or not it would be challenged again and it's also, the challenge itself was not up to me to decide. Um, the challenge was presented to our state's attorney's office and together them and I went to the precinct boards and the precinct boards made those decisions, not myself. I was just there as a witness. So I can't guarantee anything because I don't know what will happen at that time. Thank you. Any public comment on the recount? Gary Meyer, uh, the uh, precinct board rejected those ballots. I'd like to know under whose authority that was overridden. The recount board had full authority given to them. So the recount board approved adding them back in? Correct. Okay. I'm John Cunningham. Uh, there Two issues here, the, uh, the 132 votes, which was uh, is a separate issue, but the recount itself, uh, it seems to me as a citizen that uh, things are out of control here. We're using a hand counting system to confirm a machine count. We have a machine that counts fast, inexpensively, uh, completely accurately and reliably and we, we're confirming it with a highly, uh, a bad system. Hand counting is notoriously biased, subject to fraud, uh, and slow and expensive. And the question that uh, as I as a citizen have is, if there's money to do that, and this and you're in the midst of budget session, if there's budget, if there's money to do that, um, is there any other are there any other things we could do with that money that would be of real benefit to the citizens of Sioux Falls? That recount was totally useless, uh, better than most. Most uh, recounts find that the, uh, the hand count isn't the same as the machine count because, of, because people, um, either by actual bias, accidental bias, or intentional bias, uh, count things wrong. And uh, it's sort of like, I, I compare it to if Commissioner Benica uh, totals up 50 numbers on an Excel spreadsheet, if he hits the sum button, it'll be the, it'll be the correct number time after time after time. If Commissioner Ben, I don't mean to pick on you, Commissioner Bender totals those same, uh, to check it, checks it out by totaling the same 50 numbers up, she may not come up with the same number. There's a likely, some likelihood of error, have to redo it again, 
and there may be an error in the second time. Maybe a long time, and cannot confirm. You cannot use a flawed system to confirm a good system. That's the fundamental problem here: is we're using a flawed system to confirm a good system, and I, I it just makes no sense to me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cunningham. Uh, did you sign in, sir? Okay, just a reminder for everybody to please sign in. Thank you. So we're talking about the recount, and we got three races that were recounted, so I'd like to stay on subject here. Good morning, Rihanna Ola, Minnehaha County, and that was going to be my question. Was the recount, the machine count, when they did the recount, was also done by the machine? I guess I'd let the auditor answer that question. So the recount was the machine recount. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Penny Baybridge, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Um, sometimes this is, you know, confusing for people when they do things. I appreciate your patience. So, yes, it was a machine recounting machine. Uh, and that's the issue that you're asking about right now for comment. Any other comment for hand count would come later. Um, I did attend the tail end of it and got to see them working. And it was interesting to, um, I was um, watching what they were doing, having all my questions answered about how it was done. So I thought it was done very well within the parameters of what they were doing. And I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Rick Weibel, I'm not a resident of uh, Minnehaha, but I did help uh, Leah with the uh, test decks uh, before. Uh, the actual election, and I want to thank the volunteers and Leah Anderson for using our new prime number tests in the test decks to actually help confirm that the machines were going to be accurate. And the beauty of the recount is that it proved the accuracy of the machines again during the recount. One thing that we have to be careful of is that candidates do have a legal right to question the elections and performance of the machines when they find that there may be issues in the election. And so the recount is part of our statutes, and those three candidates are honored by being able to present their legal arguments, ask for a recount, which did cross the finish line, and then we find that because of another situation, the numbers were adjusted. And so when all of that comes in, our election process worked. And so again, I want to thank Leah Anderson for doing the new prime number test that helped ensure the accuracy of the machines and the programming functionalities and the correct programming and mapping up front. And then we'll talk about the other pieces that she did to ensure election integrity. So when you have proper oversight over the elections, whether it's the auditor, candidates, the legal process, you should be proud that you have stood the test of each of those benchmarks so far through the recount. Thank you. All right. Sorry, I'll keep it short. Jessica Palama, Minnehaha County. And I just want you all as a board to know that it appears Leah Anderson was the only auditor in the state that actually complied with the unique number requirement for the tests um, as we have obtained counties or copies from counties all over the state that did not comply with the new state law. So again, she far above and exceeded everyone else. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to close public comment on the recount. Um, questions from the commission of the auditor on the recount. I guess just one thing, Leah. During the recount, there was a hand count of the precinct 0203, correct? It was a uh, hand count of 0206 for just the commission race. And that was the recount board had the um, authority by law to be able to do that to verify results. So they're allowed, they are instructed to look through every ballot for a ballot stamp. So they look through every 13,000 some ballots for a ballot stamp. I will say when we get into the post selection on it, they did miss a couple. Um, but also they had the authority to be able to hand count any portion of that that they chose to do so. All righty. All right, Commissioner Bender. So I have just one question too. On the um, 
briefing memo, the 2024 primary count comparison that you posted online over the weekend, I believe. That, that has, well, that incorporates the post-election audit as well. Correct. But I just had a question on the recount because I thought the recount only checked the three races that were contested. But you show a recount for every single race, and I just was confused by that. That's because we had to count the entire county for the commission race and also because those ballots were reintroduced to the totals. So we ended up with new official results, complete official results um, from the recount for because all of the ballots race. were counted. Okay. But I, I was here that day and curious, you did a recount of the District 11 um, representative race and ran those precincts and then you took and re-ran the entire county again? Why couldn't you just do the county all at once to catch them all? So we started with precinct two, three. So we ran those first so that the people that were waiting for just that, okay. those results were able to leave if they wanted to. Then we added in, we didn't start over, we added in District 11 and we ran those results on the machines. Okay. So then that way anybody that was here for District 11 could hear the results and leave. And then we completed the day by running the remaining ballots so you to didn't get run the total. Three times you ran, no. Okay. That's where I was confused. Okay. okay. Thank you. You're okay. welcome. Okay. All righty. Commissioner Blindberg. Just to make sure I understand, when you run them for the recount with the machines, then it automatically recounts every vote that was cast for every race? Correct. Okay. Yes. And it doesn't take any more or less time to do it that way? No. Okay. All right. Moving on to the post-election audit. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the post-election audit, um, which... Uh, is required by law, just to clarify, uh, I know Mr. Cunningham made mention that it was a waste. Um, so the post-election audit is a new state law, and at every primary and general election, it's required. There are stipulations as far as um, there, there are times where it wouldn't be required, but it is a new law. Um, the post-election audit for the 24 primary election was conducted on June 25th. Uh, this was the first ever post-election audit for Minnehaha County and the state. So I would say it was historical because um, it's never been done before. The training for the audit began at 9 a.m. And the first team that began counting ballots started at about 10.30 a.m. Uh, there were a total of 570 races counted, and I'll explain that because it seems like a lot. Um, so I took the 81 precincts, we had ballots separated for election day and absentee. And then I took the number of, of races that were on each ballot. So that's what, how I created a total of 570 items that were audited. Um, of the 570 items that were audited, we did have to um, sign and prepare certificates for each of those items. And so I brought up a box of paperwork here um, because we'll talk about that again later. But um, there were the 570 certificates that had to be completed and then th that's what was turned into the state for the audit. Um, so moving on, um, and th that was all uh, sent to the state on the 26th. The time to complete the full audit did go longer than expected. Um, and a big factor in that was the extra time that it took com to complete all of that paperwork. So for each of those 570 items that were audited, the teams had, so we had people broke into teams of five people per table with 10 tables. And they had to sign, they had to print and sign their name, every one of them, on each of the tally sheets. So at each table, there would have been two tally sheets going at the same time for the race. If they, if they had to go onto a second sheet 
for the tallies, if it went over 100 votes per candidate, they'd move on to a second tally sheet. Each of those sheets of paper had to have their names printed and signed on each one. So that was a, a very large time factor, and that slowed down the process quite a bit. And then during that time, um, myself and others were preparing those certificates to have those signed by each of those members of the board. Um, there were a total of, uh, with that being said, there was a total of 1,593 approximately pieces of paper that had to be signed. Um, 570 of those I had to physically sign the next day on the 26th before I could send those to the state. So I know a lot of our media were contacting me uh, starting the night of the audit and into the morning of the next day on the 26th wanting results. But my priority at that time had to be getting those certificates signed and getting those to the state. And then I could start compiling those results and showing some comparisons. Um, in races that, it, oh, I talked about that with if they were over 100. But um, so anyway, like I said, there was two people tallying at each table. Um, and uh, I'm hopeful in the future that we can make some changes through the Board of Elections on maybe changing tally sheets, changing the process of the certificates, um, possibly including more than one race on a certificate for that precinct so that people could sign fewer sheets of paper. Um, one thing I do want to point out too in the time aspect was a lot of people that came to this, I've had maybe about half of them that had gone through some training, and the other half, their, their training was conducted that morning. So we had people of different skill levels, but everybody, their goal was to be accurate. And so some teams were able to be quick and accurate, and other teams wanted to go slower so that they could be accurate. But accuracy was a key factor, and I would say overall, um, our teams were very accurate. So people do have the ability to count ballots and be accurate. Um, so we began with the members um, counting the absentee ballots because those were in smaller quantities and that was able to help them get their feet wet and uh, then move on to some of the larger uh, groupings of ballots. Overall, the feedback that I've received from our post-election audit board has been positive. They enjoyed going through the process, learning, and having the opportunity to be involved in our elections. Even with, um, even with a later ending time than expected, many people wanted to stay and complete the process. We did have a few members that had to leave early and I also had a team of uh, backups in place, just like we would on election day for precinct boards, if we have an issue that comes up and we have to incorporate a backup person, we had that available for the post-election audit. And we did have to implement some of those backup people that came in and helped complete the audit so that we could be done that night. We provided um, sandwiches, snacks, and water. Um, which all of that gets reimbursed through administrative rule by the state. Um, one of the board members also that was volunteering her time also volunteered to purchase pizza for the entire crew. And that really boosted the morale just a bit, uh, especially towards the end of the night when people were tired and hungry. Um, we took another break and they had pizza. Um, some of the people that started late that wanted to volunteer their time were not able to because they didn't get here early enough to sign the waiver for volunteer services. And so when I was initially putting together my, my figures on cost and um, what will be reimbursed to the state, a couple of those volunteers um, are gonna, gonna get paid because they have to now because they didn't complete that volunteer form. So in putting some quick numbers together, um, initially I had about $6,000 of cost for um, actual pay. It's about 6,500, and like I said, some of that being paid out to people uh, they did not want to be paid. Um, 
the food and water cost was about $225. And all of this will be submitted to the state for reimbursement. Um, then we go into, if you scroll down a little bit, this was my initial chart uh, when we get down a little farther, right there. So starting on this page, each of you have this. Um, this was part of the agenda packet. So what I did was I went through and I just listed out in this chart the 52 items of the 570 that had differences. And so you'll see the tabulation count, which is from the recount on Monday with comparison to the hand count, and then the differences to the right-hand column. <clears throat> if you scroll down, all 52 of those items are listed. And <clears throat> these races were off by anywhere from one to three votes. I would say that in looking at this, Yes, it looks minimal. So a couple things I would point out. We talked about some of the negatives, the extra time that it took and the paperwork. But some of the positives are that people can really count ballots, that hand counting provides more transparency by doing this post-election audit, and that the citizens enjoyed being engaged in the process. Um, one thing is, before we get to these colored charts, that um, the voter intent is never taken into consideration in tabulation. And I instructed people of that also as they were counting. So yesterday, I decided to take a one of the smaller uh, items that had a difference. If you scroll back up to where um, she can that, edit out charts. Thanks. Yeah, that's. I asked Mike to if he could hand those out to you. So before you look at this, I want to explain something. So yesterday we had one race um, where the tabulation count. This is VP03 absentee. The tabulation count was 12 and the hand count was 13. So there was a difference of one, and I figured people were going to want to know which was correct. Is the hand count correct or is the tabulation count correct? So the beauty of the system that we have that's called the electionware management system, that's the laptop that we use for elections. The beauty of that this time around for this election was that I chose to um, save the ballot images. There was controversy with the state as far as whether or not those ballot images could be saved. Um, we got direction from Sarah Frankenstein that yes, they could be, and then the state actually said that they would prefer that we not save them. So because I have the ballot images, I was able to look at this particular count and look at every ballot, and I went through and tried to figure out what, um, what would be the difference in that one vote. And I need to, do I just power that on or no? Sorry. <laughs> I'm not the technology person. I just there we go. Enough. Okay, so let's go like this. Okay, so on this particular ballot, as I was going through each ballot and trying to figure out what could have possibly caused that one vote difference, I ran across this ballot. And as you can see, if, if this would have gone to resolution, um, if you're looking at the commission race right down here, they would have counted that vote most likely for Roger Russell and Cole Heisey. There's enough of a small um, scribble mark in the oval that instead of this being counted, if you look on your second page right here, where it counted it as an undervote, 
instead of that being counted as an undervote, the tabulation machine should have kicked that out to the top bin as a mismark or an unreadable item. And then it would have gone to resolution. And then this ballot would have been recreated or corrected by the resolution board so that this ballot would have been counted properly. Um, the hand counters counted this ballot for Roger, and that's why there was a one vote difference in that hand count. But the tabulation machine did not count this ballot that way. So this was the only one that I had time to go through yesterday, but I do have the ability to go through each of those 52 items that were off by one to three votes, and I could look at these ballots and make a determination as to how that vote was different. So I just wanted to show this to you. This is also something that I will be, I will be planning on talking to ESNS about, because that little bit of mark in that oval should have triggered this ballot to either be counted or to have gone to the top bin, and it wasn't. Um, the other thing that I did provide to you, I know um, Commissioner Bender held up this sheet. So I created, this spreadsheet was created after the agenda item was put on there, but we did add it yesterday. And this is also available for the public to look at um, on our website now. So this is just a comparison of the official results from Monday when we ran all the ballots through. The recount, or I'm sorry, the official results from June 4th, the recount results and the post-election audit. So this is just a comparison so that people would have those numbers available to them. And I am available for questions. Mr. Chair, I'd have a couple questions. Okay. Commissioner, do you mind if I go to public comment first as a matter of protocol? That's fine. Thank you. I'll open this for public comment and then we'll go to commission questions. Good morning, Jessica Paul, I'm a, a Minnehaha County. Sorry, I don't have much of a voice today, but um, I was honored to uh, participate in this process and the historical process, as Leah mentioned. I was actually the superintendent of the post-election audit board. And um, I thank you for presenting that today because um, there was a lot of those issues on post-election audit counting day, um, which the whole purpose of that does come down to voter intent. We actually have state statutes that require the precinct and the counting boards to endeavor to determine um, the voter intent. It's required by law. And the machines do not determine voter intent because they're programmed to read a little white space and inside an oval, which if anyone then marks a different way, their vote is cast aside and doesn't count. That disenfranchises voters. And uh, secondly, I wanted to address the media circus around this. Um, if you look at the narrative put out by McPherson County and uh, South Dakota Searchlight and other media outlets um, saying that this was a waste of time and money, that the people make mistakes, and McPherson County <clears throat> post-election audit recount of the audit proved that the people made mistakes. Well, in fact, that's not true. Uh, there's four affidavits presented um, from citizens that did the same thing as this ballot marking with the images. Um, it came down to voter intent. Uh, they were instructed to think like a machine. And we actually had a commissioner in that county digging through a pile of ballots to determine how the machine thought without the ballot images to reference. And then they changed those results to think like a machine. That totally defies the purpose of a hand count post-election audit. So again, I believe this auditor, by not providing the machine results, <clears throat> instructing the teams to determine voter intent and the accurate and real results of the election, because yes, people can reason and think and determine voter intent, which is, again, required by law. Again, far and above, went above every other county in the state. And second, uh, thirdly, she modified the tally sheet uh, because the one prescribed by the Board of Elections in the legislature is antiquated, inefficient, and prone to error. <clears throat> and she modified it best as she could, even though the horizontal layout uh, does mess with your eyes after a while. 
Uh, a new tally sheet needs to be adapted because again, the post-election audit is mandated by state law now. We're gonna be doing this going forward and uh, there's new ways to do this and um, the new tally sheets did not use the hash marks. They had little boxes for number, which also increased the speed and efficiency. Thank you. Good morning again, Rian Ullum, Minnehaha County. I also was privileged to participate in the hand count audit. Um, thrilling to be part of history. Uh, it was a very long day, longer than expected. Um, I think a lot also because we had a lot of newbies. I had been trained before. I, it had been a long time since I'd seen it done. But I myself and my team of five counted 18 precincts. Um, and then I moved to another table and we counted an additional two. Uh, of those, the only ones I believe that had one race, there might have been some more, but was mostly the Democratic uh, presidential race. It's very efficient. Um, again, provides transparency and gives those of us that don't trust the machines comfort. Anytime you can get more uh, of your people involved in elections, I think it gives people a lot more comfort knowing that things are counted the way they are supposed to be counted. We had different party affiliations at our table. Even before we started, two gals were sitting there and said, hey, we're the same party. So they realized before I even did that they needed to switch sides. Our table decided to all stay in our same positions all day. It was working beautifully. And I wanna tell you, this way of hand counting is very efficient. You count in packs of 25, and when something comes up, you stop there. And it happened maybe three times for us that we had to go back and count an additional 25, which added maybe a few minutes. I highly recommend. I want to um, thank Leah and you all for, um, I don't know if you guys agreed to it, but I'm glad it happened. Um, and I hope that we can continue in the future doing hand count audits. Uh, I think it just... Um, provides, as I said before, a lot more comfort to everyone knowing that things are being counted as they should be. Thank you. I am Linda Montgomery. I'm from Lincoln County, and I want to just be able to tell you what the difference was between Minnehaha and Lincoln. It's on one ballot that uh, a representative race there was two clearly marked ovals and another oval that was marked and then X'd out. And my thinking was, we as the table, what was voter intent? And they said the two that were just regular filled oval, not X'd out. Then I was told, our table was told, we are not allowed to go with voter intent. We had to think like a machine, and what would the machine have done? And so that ballot got thrown out. And so all choices of that voter were thrown out. So what Leah did here is the correct way to do a post-elected audit, I believe. To voter intent is why we're all here. We have the ability to vote for people, and we want our choices to count. That ballot was totally thrown out. Thank you. Alan Wheat, Minnehaha. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, comment on the fact that uh, over 200 years we had hand counting, and the fact that somehow the republic survived. and. The machines are a great asset if we can check them. And I don't know if you remember in uh, our last auditor's gold standard, they had to fix the machine because it wasn't tallying things right. And I go, what? The machine's perfect, we can't be wrong. So in this opportunity we have, we have the machine run twice, we have two people counting and verifying themselves. 
I mean, gosh, we have the best standard. Above the gold standard, we're now at platinum. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Melissa Molstead. I live in rural Minnehaha County. Uh, this is only the second commissioner's meeting I've been to, but I have appreciated being able to come. So thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. I have been uh, worked. I've worked the polls. I think four times in the last over the last several years, and it has been very interesting, and I've enjoyed it. Um, I also was able to participate in the audit uh, this last week. I wasn't able to stay the whole time, and I hated that I had to leave, but next time, if we get to do it again, I will clear my schedule. I just wanted to share my perspective I woke up with this morning that it's such a great civic duty that we were allowed to participate in, and it was such a great environment to come and to work with people who you know probably think differently about our country, about the way it's run, about things that are happening, probably would vote differently at the same table and work together. And it struck me how, um, especially now in America, we're so divided and there's so much animosity um, against people who maybe don't think the same way instead of coming together. And this gave us an opportunity to meet people that maybe we wouldn't otherwise have met, work together civically toward a goal that is positive and important for our community. And I just wanted to say thank you. And I think that that's a really um, great thing that we could be a part of. Thanks. Um, Penny Baybridge, <clears throat> uh, Sioux Falls here in Minnehaha County. Um, I just wanted to make a comment here that um, the, the statement that we often hear is hand counting is flawed and machines are perfect. Um, but all school board elections in Sioux, in Sioux Falls, I think in South Dakota, up until just this year, were hand counted. And so hand counting has been going on in the state for since the existence of the state. And so we don't doubt the uh, validity of uh, school board hand counting, and we should do the same with these as well. Um, hand counting takes practice, not just training. And, and I compare it to, let's say you want to golf, and so you get a book and it tells you, well, this is your mallet or your club or whatever you call it, and you swing it this way, and this is how you count your scores. And okay, now you've had your training, I want you to go out and play in the, the US Open. You know, it does take practice, and so this is a learning curve for all of us. Uh, the fact that we had, you know, this many people having a chance to practice will get better as time goes on, and we're, we're learning from it. Um, I had notes here. I'm trying to you know, stick with this here, but uh, this audit is for this election only. We can only say that in this one, this is what the count was. We can't say this proves that all machines are always right, and so we don't need to do the hand counting. Each one stands on its own. Each one needs to be audited. Um, so I wanted to thank Lee and his staff for uh, and appreciate the commission's support in continuing to do this. And I do remember one thing, if I can say, about when I watched the recount. Um, there are normal ballots and then ballots that are for the handicap um, uh, that are a different shape. And I understand that it was discovered at this, when they were doing the recount, that the machine was not picking up the stamp on that smaller ballot, and it's something it should have kicked out and it didn't. But um, Lee and her staff caught that this time, and so then those were accurately taken care of. Thank you. Rick Weibel from uh, Brookings, and I want to really thank you guys for doing a 100% post-election audit. Unfortunately, what happened in Brookings, when we did our two uh, random drawings, the statewide one was the Democrat uh, ballot for uh, president, so that got thoroughly more votes investigated in the one precinct that was looked at. We're a vote center, and what happened is the other Republican race that was picked, there was only two ballots that were selected for the post-election audit. So that's a gap in the law that I want to work to try and help improve because it's not sufficient enough. And we look at the bipartisan nature of the United States Election Assistance Commission and all the way through what Leah just did here in your county. And what we've provided for as a state <clears throat> is taking that first step 
to join the other 45 states that were doing post-election audits before we started. But they're not equivalent. Post-election audits mean different things. What you guys have accomplished here in Minnehaha County gives the connection back to the voters, and especially with our state motto, under God, the people rule. Under God, the people actually did a 100% post-election audit to be able to reconnect themselves in a bipartisan way to ensure that everything was on the up and up in their elections. We should not be afraid of that. Some of the things that we learned is that, hey, we have an issue with voters who may not be able to fill out a ballot the way you and I can in sticking within the lines. So voter intent is lost. And so when we look at the disability community and people who may not be able to hold a pen, who are embarrassed because they feel that they may be singled out to go use an express vote machine, we have to change that, but we also have to educate people. There are things that we can do to help ensure during close elections that we do have voter intent uh, taken care of. Having the cast vote records and the ballot images turned on is an important piece of part of the post-election audit. It says so on ESNS's website when you look at their frequently asked questions that the ballot images and cast vote records are an essential part of a post-election audit. So the fact that you can go back and actually review the why, why the differences is instructive as to do we need to go back and communicate with the SNS to increase the performance detection at 5% instead of 10% or 20% within the oval? Or do we have to put out an education campaign to the voters to let them know how important it is? That transparency is the inoculation to all conspiracy theories. Congratulations on a good auditor, a good team, a good community that stepped forward to ensure the elections are at 100% trustworthy because you did everything right from start to finish. And having an ISO mind for continuous improvement is what we need to be. Thank you. Good morning, Scott Montgomery, Fairview, South Dakota. Um, I think the reason we got to this point is remember the hanging chads in Florida and how many months and months and months that took. It was all about voter intent. The machines can't decide what voter intent is. Humans can. And to turn those ballot images off is dead wrong because those ballots get sealed away where we can't touch those. The ballot image is there, doesn't identify the voter. Those need to be turned on so we can go back and see what the voter intent was. Thank you very much. Randy Amundsen, I'm a Sioux Falls resident. Uh, my big takeaway from this recon, and I was a part of it, uh, I spent the, I don't know, 10 or 11 hours counting, and it's a, it's a tedious job, believe me. My big takeaway from it, guys, was that it took too long. The recon was longer than expected. They were there till well into the night. Um, in a normal election, as I would understand it, there wouldn't be one precinct counting 18 precincts worth of votes. One precinct board would count their precinct. They would then turn it into the auditor to get reaffirmation of their count from the machines. I believe that's the way it's designed to be. And if one precinct counted one precinct's ballots, it would be done in two hours. Thanks. All right, I don't see anybody else coming in for public input. I will turn it over to the commission for any questions that they may have. Commissioner Kipley, I think you were first. Yeah, I, had, I had some clarifying questions if we can if Leah or our staff can scroll back up to our, our memo that we've been working off of, the chart here, page 42 of the packet. <clears throat> It'd be item nine, the yep, auditor's right briefing. Nope, item nine. Thank you. 
there we go. And if we could scroll down maybe one page to get to a chart here. So I know one of the races I got some attention was the Republican Precinct Committee Man Race 2-3. I see Corey Rayfelt, original Canvas 90, recount Canvas 90. And then can we scroll down to page 46 in our chart that was provided? Corey Rayfeld, 2-3. One more page. So if you recall, it was 90, 90. Now we say 83, 84 with a difference of one. Any thoughts on that? Let me let me get my packet here. But it his his count went up by one, and Alan Unruh, which was the other candidate, his stayed the same. Um, that let me grab the packet and I can verify. Okay, I have that sheet right here. So the election day count was 83. The hand count was 84 on Corey's. That is one that I have not pulled up on the EMS system yet to look at those, but it did up his count by one, which made the difference in the two uh, by two votes instead of one. And I guess just to re-clarify my question, I guess uh, I'm looking for the discrepancy between saying he has 90 votes and 83. Am I gathering that that's the uh, distinction between election day and absentee? If you'd add them all together, you'd, you'd still get back to 90? Correct, yes. Okay. And so go ahead. for that particular one, uh, I should that should have said 0203 um, election day. Okay, and I guess my point there is obviously I asked a question to clarify and partial information can can lead you astray sometimes and I'm just glad nobody had done an hour long special with the my pillow guy on uh, that discrepancy. So thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd have one other question. Uh, as we get to the uh, extolling the virtues of hand counting. Uh, so imagine we're at November 5th at 7 p.m. What would the auditor's ad office advise? Um, should we be hand counting or machine counting? What would your recommendation be? Well, um, in this particular situation for this election, we had 49 precincts that had under 150 ballots. Um, if I was making a recommendation, if we had that many precincts that had under 150 ballots, I would agree with Mr. Amundsen Randy that spoke a little bit ago, that those ballots could be counted at the precinct and then verified by tabulation, and it would not add that much time to the night. Um, I still strongly believe in using both systems. Um, I believe you can tabulate the votes for speed and get the results quicker because our society has turned into a society of wanting absolutely quick everything. But I do also strongly believe that an audit procedure is important because it helps to verify those results. So auditing, just like we do in our financial world and that I did for 30 years, auditing is important. It holds people accountable and it verifies that you can trust a system. It's not something that you can do once and say we're done with it. It has to be done on a regular basis. The county is currently undergoing their audit for financial and procedures. That audit doesn't do anything for elections. Um, that is strictly a financial and procedural audit. Um, so I will always stand strong on the importance of auditing. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and, and I don't think uh, anyone on this commission has really questioned the need for auditing, qua auditing, um, just as a definitional matter. I think there is some concern about the 
time allotted and some of the issues that go around with hand counting such that I just wanted your recommendation as a policy matter going into the November election, what we would do with hand counting. Um, my forecast, just to respond, would be we had you know certain estimates that were given to us of how long this would take and it took longer. You'd be starting at 7 p.m. and if I had to guess from a policy matter, we'd be counting ballots in the middle of the night and you talk about inoculation against conspiracy theories, if we're counting at 3 a.m., that's just not a good perception to have. So having the machines count the ballots is going to be our most efficient way, especially when we would expect uh, uh, the turnout to be five times as high in, in November. So I just don't see that uh, hand counting is going to be the proper methodology. Now, if there's, again, following state statute, um, we would have an audit after the fact, but that's just my contribution to the dialogue. I'll yield back, Mr. Chair. All righty. Other commission questions? Commissioner Bender. So just as a point of clarification, the audit included the 132 ballots that had previously been um, rejected, and it also included the three express vote ballots that had been um, removed by the recount board due to the stamp. No, the audit <clears throat> did include the 132 ballots. The express vote ballots that they pulled were no longer part of that process. So our audit was in comparison to the recount numbers, those numbers that happened on Monday so that we could be looking at the same items, apples to apples. Um, just a clarification on those express vote ballots as well. Um, I just wanted to clear up something those express vote ballots the machine this was a great learning tool because the machine will not read the stamp on the express vote ballot we went through that uh, a lot in training how important the ballot stamp is on all the ballots we told them where to stamp the ballot it was supposed to be stamped on the back side the other piece that we learned by doing this was how important it is for those staff people that are operating the tabulators to physically take those express vote ballots and look at them and make sure that there's a ballot stamp on them. Because if there's not, they can't be counted. So the recount board removed three express vote ballots because they were missing the stamp. Those three ballots were not counted in the audit, so that's not part of the discrepancies. And the audit teams, I believe there were two times that uh, somebody called me over because they had an express vote ballot that was missing a stamp. So two items on express vote ballots were also not counted for the post-election audit because of the stamp. Okay. Commissioner Beninga. Uh, We've had some comments, I guess, about the training process, and you've made some comments about that. Uh, the people that were leaving early and then they were replaced, did they get the same amount of training? And how many people actually left early? Uh, do you have accurate information about that? Yeah, I believe we had um, at different times. We had maybe a total of five or less people that had to leave early from their assigned table. Uh, we ended up with five people that stepped in that were part of our backup team. Um, a lot of those people had previously been trained. Um, also, they were able to sit at a table that was already working prior to joining a team. So they did get training as well, and then they got time to observe the process before they started in on that process. All right. <clears throat> Commissioner? Uh, I just wanted to, to comment on, oh, sorry. Um, I just wanted to comment on the process and thank all the people that worked um, on it. And I was curious, just overall, do you feel like this was a successful um, process with the post-election audit? And um, do you have any thoughts to share about what that might look like for the general election, going back to Commissioner Kipley's 
Sure. Um, yes, I, I am, like I said, I'm strongly in favor of the process that we did. Um, I know there's some improvements that can be made, and I hope to be able to work with the state on that. Um, I think the process was successful, even with the extra time. I think that um, the positives definitely outweighed the negatives. And um, going forward, uh, I've been asked, you know, what does the post-election audit look like for the general election? It's very hard to tell at this point. One, I don't know what all's on the ballot, for sure. It's not completely set in stone yet. Um, I don't know what the turnout's going to be like. So I will have to gauge what I think we could do again in a day. I will have to gauge that once we have more information. Um, do I think it's going to be 100%? Probably not. Um, but I, I can't give you an actual figure at this point in time. And I'd also like to see how the state handles the reimbursement process before I make that decision. I'm interested in that, too, because <laughs> historically the state has not been very forthcoming. I think if we can get Five, they, if they say 5%, they're probably only going to pay for 1 20th of those costs. So I'm, I'm interested to hear how that comes out because they, they're they pretty tight with the dollars. Um, my question, Auditor Anderson, is by state statute, if you hand count in the precinct, that ballot box then has to become sealed and you can't bring them back and run them through the tabulators. Is that correct? It's not completely correct. I, I would I would rely on our state's attorney to make that decision. Um, however, there is a codified law that gives the commission the ability to, um, hopefully I can get the wording correct here, off the fly, um, to um, go with the tabulation system to make modifications to that system, meaning you can do a combination of hand counting and tabulation. Um, it's up to, the way it's worded in that codified law is the governing board, which you as the commission are, is the way it's explained to me, you are the governing board. Um, so there are avenues that could be looked at. Um, there's also things to consider about the ballot itself, because if you choose to use an optical scan ballot, which means tabulation, um, that there are some things that come into play with that. So I don't think I'm the right one to answer those questions. Um, but I do think being feasible in an election that had this low of turnout, when in many, I had mentioned I think 49 precincts had under 150 ballots, many of those had under 100 ballots. In fact, some of them had maybe 36 or 44 ballots. Those ballots could have been counted at the precinct level very quickly and then brought back for tabulation if that would be an approved process. Okay, so yeah, let's talk about that turnout because in 2020, what was it, 92,000 ballots cast versus 13,000, so Commissioner Kipley had mentioned five times, it's more like seven times, so yeah, 100% audit would be undertaking and, and a half. Um, what can you, you know, conclusions can you draw from, you know, the hand counting of this? The, and I, I agree, the audit is necessary, and I'm glad the state legislatures finally put that into law that we do an audit. But what conclusions do you, can you draw from this audit? Um, some of those I mentioned earlier. Uh, conclusions are, I think, the people that were in part of the process thoroughly enjoyed being part of that process, even though it took longer. Um, I agree that it was a it was a good way to build transparency, to have transparency, to build confidence. Um, I don't think it's something that we can just say one and done, that we're confident that every election is going to be good. There can be cheating in both machine tabulation and also hand counting. So I will never say that one is completely better than the other. I think a combination of the two is definitely warranted. Um, as far as the post-election audit process, conclusions would just be 
I think we've we've started a great process. We have some people that are now trained and familiar with the process. I hope they're ready to come back for the general election. I know for the general, it's gonna open up the door for more people that were previously trained because they were on the ballot, so they were unable to participate in this post-election audit, but they were trained. So I do look forward to the general election and having another chance at this and seeing what improvements we can make to make this process go even better than it did this time. Again, this was our first time. Um, yes, there was a learning curve, and uh, due to a lot of the paperwork, um, it took extra time. So. All right. Additional questions? All right. Thank you very much. Oh, Commissioner Benega. Uh, we've got this 11% or whatever the number was exactly uh, that voted this time. Assuming that we have seven times that amount for November in four months, are you capable of expanding your base of volunteers and people that are volunteering for this by seven times? And you start talking about hand counting and how long is that going to take if you got seven times as many people voting? Well, for one, it's not up to me to incorporate hand counting for official tabulation. Um, as far as volunteers, I think both for higher turnout for the election itself in November on election day, yes, I, I believe we have a great pool of volunteers. We have more people. There, every day we get forms turned in where people want to help with that process. So yes, we do have the capability to add more volunteers or more people helping. They're not all volunteers because they do get paid. Um, we do have a good pool of people for the post-election audit. And like I said earlier, um, I'm not planning necessarily to do a 100% post-election audit for the general. I have to look at the turnout. I have to look at how much is on the ballot and make that decision. Um, I would say even if, if I did a 25%, let's say, um, post-election audit, um, I, I think doing 5% and two races really does not give you a very good outcome of, of uh, comparison. I think that's too low. So um, somewhere between that 5 and 25%. But yes, I definitely can expand the volunteer base. And um, there's other options too. We don't have to do this on a Tuesday when there's a commission meeting going on, or you know, we could even choose maybe a Saturday to um, have the post-election audit where people are more available. So there's definitely a lot of options to consider. Um, we are limited in space. Uh, we used the two rooms to my right, uh, the training room and the multi-purpose room. So um, it's just a matter of of weighing all of those decisions and making uh, decisions as to what would work best. I guess my next, <clears throat> excuse me, my next question is going to be with the people who are screaming about transparent transparency, and you change the process where some are counted manually and some are done electronically. What's that going to do for their comfort level? Well, I'm not. Um, advocating for a change right at this moment. Um, but that's what you're kind of telling us right now, is that you're going to make some changes for smaller precincts. No, that has to be done by the governing board, and we have to look at codified law. That's not what I'm asking for. I said, when the question was raised to me, what would November look like if we did that, I was just saying, I was re responding to that question, that that's what it would look like in my mind is if you had fewer than per codified law how it used to be if you had less than 300 ballots at a precinct they were counted at the precinct that codified law is still on the books um, some of that's been replaced by the tabulation process um, so i was just explaining that if we looked at those figures for instance in this election only three of our precincts had over 300 ballots. I was just giving an example. So I am not right now asking for that to happen at the November election. I don't think that would be the election to start throwing in changes. 
um, that may not be a wise decision. And, and I would certainly rely on visiting with the state's attorney's office, like I have done in the past, about looking at all of that information. Um, when you talk about transparency in that issue, again, I think even if ballots are hand counted at the precinct level, that the best option would be to bring them back and tabulate them as well and have both sets of numbers. Then if you had a large discrepancy or if a candidate was only off by one vote, it would give more clarity um, as to where to look and where to um, investigate. I guess, yeah, I thought you were proposing something uh, already for November, but more importantly, after looking at literally what's been accomplished in this recount and the post-election audit, I think there has to be some vision that is proposed on what changes should be made and why we would make those in the future. Correct. I think cost is a big factor. Somebody mentioned that it costs a lot to hand count. I would say it costs way more to run the tabulators. All the training that my staff has to go through, all the time that is spent testing, um, there is so much cost that goes into uh, functioning with a tabulation system. Um, as, as you would notice too, the recount itself, the recount day took almost not quite as long as the post-election audit, but it took almost as long, and we were using the tabulators. So that was a, that was a very thorough process as well. Um, but I'm not proposing any change at this point in time. Um, I'm just suggesting things, talking about things, so that you and the public can be aware of all the options but I'm not proposing a change for the November election. Okay, All right. thank you for the clarification. Commissioner. Yep, sure. Yeah, I, I appreciate the uh, caution and uh, wanting to consult with the state's attorney on some of these uh, items before we get out of our skis. I, I do wanna point you to South Dakota codified law 121827. Are you familiar with that one about uh, not sh displaying or showing an image of a ballot? That is at the precinct, and that codified law has to do with a person taking a photo of their ballot and publicizing it. The cast vote record and the ballot image that I have here is used for auditing purposes. Okay. If that's you. what you're getting at, I'm, I'm not sure what you're getting at with that. Yeah, no, that's fine. Thank you. All right. This was a briefing. I'm going to consider the briefing ended and we'll move on to our next agenda item. All right. Consider a motion to approve updates to the Human Services Guidelines. Lori Manis. Good morning, Lori. Good morning, Commission. Lori Montes, Human Services Assistant Director. Um, so this morning I am looking for. Um, a motion of approval of updated guidelines for our um, human services uh, guidelines that are posted on the website. They've not been updated for quite some time. Um, and so once I started looking at them and actually had our um, state's attorney office representative start looking at them as well, um, we decided to uh, bring forward some changes that hopefully uh, will make things uh, more easily understood by the public if they do go to that website and look uh, for that information on how to apply for county poor relief. So um, I'm gonna go through this. I'm obviously not, it's a fairly lengthy document, so I'm not gonna go through everything in there, but I'm gonna just kind of, uh, I guess overall, it's just a lot of verbiage changes, um, some clarifications and some reduction and duplication of items. So I will go through some of those things that maybe have had some change um, and highlight some of those. Um, so first of all, section one, the statement of purpose, um, really the uh, duty of uh, Minnehaha County, uh, the commission and as well as human services is to relieve and support eligible county residents who are applying for financial assistance. 
Um, and so we have adopted these written guidelines so that we ensure fairness and avoid the risk of arbitrary decision making. Uh, we would hope that everybody who came in uh, presenting this exact same situation uh, would get the same outcome uh, from our staff for that consistency effort. Um, section two is definitions. There's no change uh, in that section. Uh, that all remains um, accurate and, and um, updated. Uh, section three is the general administration. So talks about things like confidentiality, county being the resource of last resort, um, not providing continuous assistance where one time, meant to be one time emergency relief assistance. Um, but under there is a section on disqualifications. And so I did want to just um, highlight a little bit of a change there, um, mostly a verbiage update to just reflect um, I think more clearly that it's the applicant's responsibility to prove their eligibility for assistance. Um, so our caseworkers would meet with somebody, um, they would identify what kinds of information or documentation they're needing to uh, verify the uh, situation or the story that the person has shared, and then they would most likely leave them pending uh, to provide that documentation. So uh, they're given 30 days to do that, um, and if they have not done it in 30 days, then we close that case for no further contact. Um, section four is the applicant's uh, rights to know, so kind of things that they can expect uh, from our staff at Human Services. No change in that area. Section five, uh, emergency services. So there's two basic sections that are listed in this guideline document. One is emergency services, and those are things like rents, utilities, deposits, medications, burials, those kinds of things. Um, and so that's what this section is describing. Um, the uh, resi residency piece, which is the second uh, piece there that's up on the screen right now. Um, that's where we really um, kind of clarified some wording to show that we follow South Dakota statute defining residency. And so in order to do that, we have our applicants uh, prove their county residency. And uh, they do that by demonstrating a personal presence in a fixed permanent abode with intent to remain there. Uh, and that's uh, per South Dakota codified law. And um, they also provide um, for that intent. That gets a little complicated. Um, how do you prove somebody intends to stay there? So there's a list of items that is also identified um, in state law that um, are things like bank accounts, pay stubs, um, registering your children in school, registering to vote, um, having any benefits. So if you're getting SNAP or that kind of thing transferred to Minnehaha County, all of those things uh, can go towards showing intent uh, to remain in our county. And then they also provide proof of identification uh, using either a photo ID or a social security card. Uh, the next section is temporary eligibility. Um, nothing has changed in that section, as well as um, the applicant section. We get to the case review uh, piece, which is a process that we followed, but it wasn't spelled out in this document. And so we just added that in, that um, a person who is denied assistance for emergency relief is able to request an appeal or a case review. Uh, and the process for that looks like this. They uh, submit in writing a request within 15 days of their denial. Um, then the person assigned to do the case review, uh, which has been me uh, for the past eight years, um, we go over that uh, request and review the, per, uh, the information that the person has provided within five days. And then uh, we have five days once the person, again, provides all of that documentation to verify their situation. Um, and then we'll either um, agree with the caseworker's decision that the person was not eligible, or we could overturn that, that um, you know, based on the information provided, uh, we would go with approving that person for assistance. Uh, type of assistance has not changed. Um, I wanted to just uh, bring forward the burial and funeral assistance. When I looked at this, um, it looked like the old numbers were still 
listed on the county website. Um, the ones that are showing here are the current ones. So our current rate of reimbursement for uh, funeral burial assistance is cremation only is 2,000. Cremation with memorial service is 2,500. And then traditional funeral uh, with a memorial service is 3,500. And it's been that way, um, I think, since 2021, if I'm not mistaken. Um, then the next section is probably where um, we cleared things up uh, fairly substantially. Our process in doing medical applications has changed uh, with retirement of one of our long-term staff who used to do the applications for uh, medical assistance for those folks that are, uh, were uninsured. Um, and are seen for an emergent uh, hospitalization situation. Um, that is now, that piece is now handled by our state's uh, attorney office rep, Mike Thompson, who's here today. Um, so we really kind of removed from there a lot of uh, duplicative items, um, some voluntary payments that were listed in there that um, at this point we um, are sticking to the um, payments that we're obligated to provide. Um, as far as decisions made for that medical determination, um, we notify the person in writing um, of their eligibility. It's called a notice of action. Everybody who applies for any assistance receives that uh, form from us. And um, it's the same kind of thing as with emergency relief. If they fail to provide the documentation, um, then we would take no action on that. Um, for emergency relief purposes, we would say no further contact and close the case. Um, and we would do the same uh, in the medical cases as well. Um, the last change uh, in the medical section is uh, the review process. So like I just mentioned, for emergency relief, there's that review process. When we talk about medical, um, since we have a uh, an attorney making the decision on the case, um, really the next step then uh, per statute is that um, a statement advising the person of their right to appeal that decision um, is given to them, um, and that would go through the appropriate circuit court. Um, I will just mention that um, with the expansion of Medicaid, um, we have seen many, many fewer applications. So it seems like most people now are eligible either for that Medicaid piece or um, they are eligible for insurance if they're employed, um, maybe through their employer or through the ACA. Um, so we have had only a, a small handful of people apply for assistance um, for medical bills um, so far this year. And then the last page is just the updated guidelines. Um, if you recall in February, uh, you gave permission to increase the housing allowance and so um, I just wanted to get the website updated to reflect our current amounts which are shown um, on the paper up front there, so increasing um, based on unit size how much um, the limit is towards helping with rent for those type of units. So that's it in a nutshell. Questions that you have for me, or I have Mike Thompson here as well, and I'm sure he would love to answer any questions too. Questions? Commissioner Bender. This is just a minor question. I really appreciate all the work that you and Mike and that your team put into this document. There are a couple of times where you said there were no changes in sections, and I know posted online is the black line that shows all the changes to the existing guidelines, and I think you were really focused on the material changes, and there were some sections where there were changes reflected in that black line document, but they were more um, semantics yeah. um, or, you know, adding a definition to make things read more clearly, and I just wanted to make sure there wasn't any question that we were trying to pull something over okay. on somebody. Sure, so. sure, yeah. Commissioner Blindberg. I know um, the fact that the room emptied out doesn't have anything to do with the importance of this. <laughs> Thank you for all the work that you guys put into this. You and Carrie and Mike, I know a lot of time was spent um, looking into the statute that applies and making sure that we're giving good guidelines for our population, but also for our staff to be able to rely on and um, looking back at precedent and making sure that we're really doing a good job of being consistent. So I just want to say thank you for all of the effort and all of the research that was put into this. Absolutely. Thank you. 
Commissioner I would just uh, echo that sentiment that this is very important elements uh, for as especially as we close out kind of our budget season. Could you give us just paint us the picture of the scale and magnitude of this of just uh, whether it's rental assistance or utilities, just kind of this bundled uh, item. How much has this been in years past uh, uh, of, a, of a of a line item in our in our county's budget? Um, well, for rent assistance, um, historically we've had in our budget line item uh, $975,000. Uh, I think the most current one is $950,000. And then just to follow up on that, we, there's just countervailing forces here with the CARES Act going away, but you, you mentioned the expansion of Medicaid might, might play a role in, in lessening this, but, but it's, it's hard to predict exactly on any given year what people will show up for this assessment. But do you know what we have budgeted in this line item for, for next year? You said it, uh, For it, the rent assistance only, it's, uh, while well, that includes deposit, is $950,000. So we expect it to be pretty flat yes. year to year. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yep. yep. I think we all got the opportunity to spend an hour or maybe a little more or less with you and Mike and this was a big undertaking, so appreciate the work, as has been said. So thank you for what you've done. Com uh, public comment on this item. Commission action. Make a motion to approve. Second. Motion and a second. Please call. No. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Consider a motion to authorize a public defender to sign the indigent defense services renewal contract for fiscal year 24-25 with the Unified Judicial Circuit for the Second Circuit Drug Court, DWI Court, Veterans Court, and Mental Health Court program. Good morning, Tracy. Good morning, Chairman Karski, Commissioners, Tracy Smith, Public Defender's Office. This is a request to renew our annual contract with the Unified Judicial System. We've been participating in this contract since 2021. Essentially, we have one attorney who handles all the contracts um, for each of these. All the courts um, participates in annual training, um, works to um, improve each of these courts. The purpose of these programs is to help participants in this program attain stability. There's five phases. Um, there's a number of phases, different phases in each of these programs. The first phase is helping each of the participants get housing. Um, if they need uh, education, a GED, um, they help them attain employment. Um, each of these programs help them um, with treatment. The overall goal is to help them be successful in the community. We represent them um, if they um, have sanctions for not following through with the program, if for any reason they have to be terminated from the program because they're not following through, we'll represent them um, on that. We're paid, the county is paid in four quarterly installments. Essentially, this is the same contract renewal from last year and we're essentially just asking that um, the commission authorize us to reassign um, resign this contract to continue participating for another year all right any public comment on this agenda item commission questions I just have a comment. I, I like poking the bear, aka the state. Um, this has been the same reimbursement for numerous years. I, our plan is to go to UJS next year and ask them to, I mean, we're spending the entire sum of an attorney's salary on this and not getting reimbursed nearly what the cost is, so. I do agree. Um, Next year, the annual rate per hour that attorneys, private attorneys, are paid is 120 an hour. Um, this year is 115 an hour. Um, most counties have to pay private attorneys for this cost. Um, so the state is getting a significant benefit by the fact that we do have a public defender's office. Um, the cost of having a, an attorney uh, salary for a year is a significantly higher than $58,000. Um, with the state creating this year the um, Indigent Defense Commission, they're currently hiring um, a statewide public defender to run that office. My hope is that um, by next year, once they have someone who fills that position, um, 
we will be in a better position to speak with that, um, the head of that agency about whether or not they would want to either um, raise the amount each year, whether or not it's more better to for them to consider a contract. Um, but I think with them just now having the commission and hiring that position, um, it would be better since June has already come and passed and they've already made that payment that it would be better to hold off on those discussions until next year. Okay. As long as we have a plan. All right. Um, commission action. I make a motion to approve. Second. Motion and second. Please call the roll. Bender? Aye. Kipley? Aye. Blindberg? Aye. Benega? Aye. Kersky? Aye. Motion carries. Consider a motion to approve or deny a special event on sale liquor license for the T Slat Incorporated DBA JJ's Wine, Spirits, and Cigars for Skate Park Fundraiser and Recognition Event on July 12, 2024. I read slow, Kim. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, Commissioners. Kim Christensen with the Auditor's Office. We received an application for a special event on sale liquor license from T Slot Inc. doing business as JJ's Wine and Spirits. The Skate Park Fundraiser Recognition Event will be held on July 12, 2024. The requested special event license, if granted, will allow the organization to sell liquor to be consumed on site. The application has been reviewed by the Sheriff's Department, State's Attorney, and Planning Department. The Planning Department recommends denial due to lack of appropriate zoning at the requested location. If the property owner applies for and obtains a temporary use permit from the Planning Department, the recommended denial would be withdrawn. And uh, Planning Director Anderson is here if you have any questions on that. I think we would have questions on that. Can we invite Scott up? Well, I'd look for um, anybody from the public um, here to comment on this. All right, questions from the commission? Commissioner Kipley? I'd, like I'd just like to hear your perspective on it, Scott, and if we've got this temporary use permit figured out or if we're still in limbo. Well, uh, the applicant has been made aware, as I understand, that a temporary use permit is required. Uh, this is not unusual. Uh, we have required in the past these type of events to obtain a, a temporary use permit. Uh, the reason that we do that is because uh, this is a, a private property First of all, we do not know the scope of what is intended. Uh, and when you, there is a, a potential when these type of uh, events and activities occur that there are issues with parking, with noise, uh, with disposal of waste. Um, there, there's just a whole host of, of issues. And so a temporary use permit is the best way to address that. Uh, it also gives the neighborhood, uh, the, the mechanism for a temporary use permit is that uh, a notice is sent out to all the property owners within 500 feet uh, in indicating the, the request, and then they have uh, 14 days to, uh, up to object to that. If they object to it, then the temporary use permit is heard by the planning commission, and, um, uh, and we have a public hearing. So. Uh, then uh, uh, conditions can be in play, uh, adopted, rec you know, addressing hours of operation, um, parking, waste disposal. There's just a whole host of issues that, that we deal, that we, we want to look at. So I'm not sure, uh, Commissioner Kipley, if that answers your, your question, but uh, it is a process that I feel is necessary and is really fair to that neighborhood. Uh, because it is a residential neighborhood and um, they could be easily overwhelmed with with people showing up and they might be quite surprised at the at the uh, the event so mr chair my only question then is on the the timeline it looks like they put in this application on june 17th but the event is scheduled for july 12th so I would 
lean towards following our planning director's process and going through that, but uh, I think he mentioned that there was a a 14-day window in there and we haven't even started or the, the applicant has not even chosen the temporary use permit option yet. No, they haven't. Okay. And I th think we're left with a quandary, but... I guess my understanding is there was a recent change in state statute that may have muddied the water a little bit. Is anybody able to talk to that point? I'm going to defer to state's attorney. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Eric Bogue, State's Attorney's Office. You're correct. There was a, a slight amendment to this particular section of state law that did exempt or remove the requirement that this be held on public property. And if it's not required to be on public property anymore, it would potentially eliminate the need for a hearing. That's not the reason for the rejection or recommended rejection of the application this morning. So it's not a hearing issue. It's a, it's a zoning issue. And so... Uh, as to other responses to that, I don't know if you have other additional questions. So prior to July 1st, they wouldn't have had to do this because that's when the law changed? Is that what you're saying? or, um, Mr. Chairman, um, members of the commission, I, in this case, I'm not sure that the, the law change makes any difference in this particular cir circumstance and actually to the one following on today's agenda as well. There are zoning concerns as to the application for the special event license itself, absent the requirement for a hearing. But because of that, the, the recommendation for denial of that application is being brought forward to you. Um, I, th I think that was conveyed to the applicant both by email and by uh, United States Postal Service letter. Uh, as far as I'm aware, the applicant has chosen not to correspond with us. So I did ask prior to today's hearing to confirm, anticipating there might be some questions today, but apparently not. So the applicant is not here. Right. Okay. Mr. Chair, can I ask a hypothetical? Um, if the applicant were to apply for the temporary use permit and get an affirmative from all of the neighbors that they would allow it would that maybe that's a, in the planning director's discretion but just to just because we're up against a timeline that I, th I think i'm apt to deny today pending this temporary use permit because it just sounds like the zoning is what it is um but because you, you have to let those 14 days run to allow anyone to object that's in correct. theory if you got an affirmative response that they are not objecting that they are willing to allow it would that justify um, allowing a temporary use permit well that is that puts that puts me in the in the puts me in a position where I'm really making a administrative decision that probably goes beyond the scope of, of my position because I think the intent and and we, we've seen this or if you if you've had if you've dealt with planning and zoning items in in a long period of time uh, oftentimes I have neighbors that uh, when I work with applicants I will tell them please go out and reach out to your neighbors and tell them what you're doing if it's a daycare a dog kennel when we go through these processes and um, you you might be surprised at how many times uh, when I tell the applicants this, I will hear, yes, I've talked to all my neighbors and they're fine. And then the notice goes out and it, you know, the notice goes out and it, and suddenly those neighbors have changed their mind. And so I don't feel like it's appropriate for me just by having people say, yeah, I'm fine with it. And then allowing them to, allowing that to happen. I, I just feel like you have to follow the procedure and the procedure is there, there's a 14-day window, and if no one, uh, if no one uh, objects, then it is approved. If someone objects, um, it goes to the planning commission. And you know, sometimes I think I'm just I'm very hesitant about approving something without those notices 
without that full time period being um, available to people to reconsider, to think about it, and then realize, ooh, I don't know. I told them I was okay with it, but now I'm maybe more concerned that 400 people are going to be driving up and down my road. And I will remind the commission this is uh, in, a, in a neighborhood uh, where we have seen um, many people being very concerned about traffic. And so, uh, you know, I just am hesitant about um, allowing doing that administratively. I can appreciate that. And then just for clarification, could you just walk through the zoning? What what are they zoned and what should they be zoned to, well, it, to make it, this work? It, the zoning is A1 agriculture and, and I'm not, I'm not uh, implying or recommending that that we change the zoning because the, 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 the benefit and the, the option is that you have a temporary use permit and a temporary use permit is for special events. We required them. We required that for life light. We've required them for other fundraising events for, uh, cancer outreach, um, events where they're doing fundraising because as I indicated, you really need to be able to get, a good idea on numbers of people, the hours that, that this is going to occur, how are they going to deal with um, waste, with noise, with you know porta potties, all those type of things, and uh, yeah, um, so it is a concern. And Mr. Chair, final clarification for me: and the applicant is on notice that they would be better apt to go down the temporary use permit. Do you know when they were on notice of that? I do not. I, I, uh, I, I deferred that to the auditor's office and uh, as it was, it was the, the liquor license that they had been dealing with and uh, I uh, do not know when they were notified exactly. I know that they were notified, notified by, as the state's attorney said, by mail and I believe by email as well. I believe the auditor might have an answer to that question. Auditor's office, Kim. They were sent an email at 1.23 p.m. last Wednesday and the letter went out that day. Yes, I did look that up in my sent items. So they were notified um, for both applications at that time. And I have not heard no response from that. Commissioner Blindberg. Those details have helped. Those were a lot of my same questions. Um, if it was submitted on June 17 and the letter went out on the 26th, it, that doesn't seem like a long period of time for your office to process, especially during a busy time of year. Um, but I'm sympathetic also to the, to the host. Um, just curious if it was not a liquor license that they were applying for, how would this be different than I know we've talked in zoning before about um, having graduation open houses and things like that. We don't require a temporary use permit for those functions. If they weren't serving liquor at this, would it still have to go through? Okay, thank you. That might be, a, that probably is an answer or a question that's directed to me. So typically like a family wedding, a, a family reunion, a graduation party, those uh, are all, uh, as I see them, accessory to the residential use that's occurring. However, having a fundraiser for a skate park that you might invite several hundred people to is not typically accessory to a single family residence. So. And then one more question. Did any of the other offices that we run this by have any um, hesitations? No. Okay. So what makes this compared comparatively, Scott, you know, if I had a wedding at my home or my family's home out in the country, it's about the fact that they're charging for the alcohol. That's part of it. It's charging for the alcohol. It's, it, 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 it just goes to that, that um, idea of what is typically associated with a single family residence. Uh, you know, yeah, it's not uncommon for you to have a birthday party at your house, or it's not uncommon for you to have an anniversary party or any kind of a party in a garage, but, and, and, you, and it may rise to the scope, uh, you may have several hundred people there. However, it's, 
it, when when you are actively promoting people to come to raise money for something, it, it goes beyond what is a typical family activity. So if they had a donor, a sponsor, whatever for the alcohol, and they weren't charging for alcohol, would we be having this conversation yes, we right would. now? It, 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 in my mind, it, in, in, in my interpretation, it doesn't really have anything to do with the charging of the alcohol. It, it really is an event. I mean, it, you're hosting an event on your property, and there are implications for that. You, um, an event that's other than that's not typically associated with a single family residence or a, or a family activity. I mean, it. Like I said, it's not a birthday, it's not an anniversary or graduation or a funeral. I mean, those are all just typical resi uh, uh, uses that can be associated with a family living there. But if I have a, you know, it, I, I, might, I might liken it, and I don't want to talk about hypotheticals, but I mean, what would, what would you think if, and I have to look at it sometimes this way, what happens if I decided I was going to host a three ring circus and I have a gigantic big top, but I'm not going to charge anything. I'm just having people show up and you have 400 or 500 people show up. And yeah, I mean, it's just, I, you know, I'm not, so it, 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 it goes and, and I, I just want to, I have to look at it sort of in the big scope of things because we have potentially uses like this that I deal with or I, or I, that will come up and I'm just treating, trying to treat everyone equally. Commissioner Blindberg. Was the applicant aware that this was going to be on the agenda today? Yes, that was in part of the notification that was sent last week. Is there a charge for or a process if I have a wedding at my house and I'm going to have somebody bring in alcohol? Do I have to apply for anything to you? Um, that wouldn't be like, what at the Isaac Walton League, we get a lot of the consume and blend licenses, which um, they're going to, we had one actually on the consent agenda, they're going to give the beverages to the people okay and there's no charge for that this one is fifty dollars per day okay okay commissioners what do you want to do well mr chair i guess i was willing to get creative and try to find a process where you could get to yes but uh, a little less sympathetic to that when I know that the person's been on notice and hasn't even responded at all you know to just even acknowledge like oh maybe we can't do it that way but can we do it this way uh, so my sympathy runs a little bit short at that point obviously willing to get creative but I just don't know how we get to yes on this one from my perspective so I would probably be a no vote I would reluctantly share those sentiments I would appreciate hearing from the applicant, but. I would imagine, you know, in the case of this fundraiser that, I mean, it's next week, the invitations went out and, you know, the other one's a wedding in September, so they would have time to go through the longer process, right? Yeah, to, to make that work. What's the cost of doing it with the notifications and everything, Scott? we have to publish and all that stuff uh, no, we don't publish it they just send out not notices to the surrounding property owners and my office says I believe it's a $50 application fee so 50 bucks there 50 bucks here okay okay other comments we need a motion to um, deny or approve yes I'll make the motion to deny I'll second Motion and a second. Further discussion? You gonna call the roll from there, Kim? Yeah. Kipley? Aye. Blindberg? Aye. Benega? No. Bender? Aye. Karski? No. So it was denied by a vote of three to two. All right, moving on. Consider a motion. Yeah, make sure I'm the right one here. To approve or deny a special event uh, on sale liquor license for the T Slat Inc. DBA JJ's Wine, Spirits, and Cigars for the Harms Wedding on September 14th, 2024. Again, Kim Christensen with the Auditor's Office. Um, again, we received a special event application for a wedding to be held in September 
of this year, the special event license, um, if granted, will allow the organization to sell um, liquor to be consumed um, on site. Again, the application was reviewed by the sheriff's office, state's attorney, and planning, and um, the planning department, and again, is recommending denial due to apparent commercial zoning nature of the facility and that such property is not zoned for commercial activity. If the property owners either apply for and receive a special event permit from the planning department or provide documentation that the special event is a family wedding between harms and the property owner, then the recommendation would be withdrawn. All right, public comment on this agenda item. Commission uh, questions or action? In my mind, the same analysis applies, and so I would make a motion to deny. Second. Motion is second. Further discussion? Call the roll. Further discussion? Um, sorry. Commissioner? Just to clarify, the same process would apply if we could change that denial? Uh, well, this is a little bit more complicated because um, this, when this came about, uh, we did some research, pulled it up, and they are actively prom actively promoting a wedding facility, a wedding barn there. So they're they are also zoned A1 Agriculture. Uh, I'm open to a temporary use permit. However, if they continue to host events, weddings, it is in direct violation of the zoning ordinance. And as you're aware, we have several wedding barns in the in the county, uh, and they have had to go through a rezoning request to allow that use. So this is going to be a little bit more complicated. Uh, it is a, they have they have a website. They've been hosting many events. They call it the Red Barn. And so it it has become, uh, known to me and it is now what I would consider a zoning violation so mm. um, so that has been made aware to the property owner as well they obtained a building permit for the big red barn about four years ago and it was clearly indicated at the time that they applied for the building permit it, that that structure was not to be used for commercial activity so it, it, it's it's a little bit more complicated that than that and it, it the property owner has been made aware. So. All right, we have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Call the roll. Bender? I am the motion to deny. Let That's what sure we're voting on, yes. <laughs> Blyenberg? Aye. Benega? Aye. Kipley? Aye. Kersky. Aye. Motion carries. All right. Last agenda item, budget discussion and consider a motion to approve a $2.5 million opt-out resolution. Susan, this resolution does not mean we are going to opt, well, it does mean we are going to opt out, but that, that we are going to use it. Correct. Um, as part of our discussion today, um, um, and as in prior meetings, we've discussed about the ongoing need that we will have in the forecast to have additional opt-outs. Um, and as part of those previous meetings um, throughout the month of June, um, we discussed that um, one of the recommendations of the fan committee from last year is that we pursue opt-outs a year prior to when we need them. Um, so as, um, as we look at our forecast, and we've discussed this um, throughout our June meetings, you know, we, we do have significant needs coming up um, throughout um, the next five years. One of them is including the expansion into UC3 for the growing jail population. Um, secondly, just the ongoing need to um, add additional staff in primarily public safety related departments. Um, and then um, as we've discussed um, at length, uh, the, the use of our ARPA dollars will be very close to fully expended by the end of this year. Um, and we've discussed also the, the need that our um, property tax formula, we have limitations on growth in CPI and CPI is capped at 3% or actual whatever is less. So based upon the forecast, there are needs um, for um, opting out um, 
in the future. So we'll just walk through um, the long range forecast again. Um, we've discussed how that um, forecast has made, um, this first one that we'll look at has not had any change from, from our previous meetings. Um, and so UC3 expansion is included. We've had uh, growth in CPI factors, uh, matrix changes for payroll, et cetera, as part of that. Um, so uh, this is the, the version you've seen before. You'll notice up here at the top, it says original opt-out scenario. So this is what you've seen before with the $2.5 million opt-out layered in. Um, and as we've talked how um, our cash balance has, um, as we've been preparing for ARPA to um, expire, we'll be using our cash reserves to bring that back down. Um, and this gray line here are our existing opt-out with full capacity, using full capacity, and the green line is actual opt-out levied. And uh, that, that difference between the gray and the green line is that opt-out that we're having um, available but not levying until a future year following that fan committee recommendation. Um, so this was that recommendation um, um, that, that we had discussed last meeting, um, showing a $2.5 million opt-out for you to consider um, with about a $3 million need potentially in the forecast for 2026. So this slide remains unchanged from what you saw last week. Um, and then uh, one of the requests from Commissioner Blindberg was, what would that look like if we did a million and a half opt out for consideration for this year? So that's the second scenario is what that would look like. So I'll just pause here um, before we go forward. And, and as I've reminded you in previous discussions, don't get locked into what these opt out numbers are. There's a lot of assumptions in here. Actual is going to be different as we go forward five years. I do not have a crystal ball. Um, I say that every time. Um, but mostly think about the trajectory um, that this is, you know, we see the need for future opt outs coming. Um, significant investment in our jail expansion and that are hitting in 2026 and 2028, and those reflected are reflected in this forecast. So I'll just pause there before we move forward. All right, public comment. Commissioner Barth. <laughs> I'm reminded why, oh, Jeff Barth, Minnehaha County. I'm reminded why I don't want your job <laughs> sitting out here, but I have some experience with this opt-out stuff. And I know that some years ago, Tracy Smith reminded me of when they raised the outside attorney's rate from 97 to $100 an hour. That's 3%, more than 3%, 97 to 100. So I was out there in Pierre and I was complaining about it. And Dusty Johnson said, well, just opt out. That was when he was working for Dugard. I actually met with uh, Judge Gilbertson in his office, which is full of clocks, by the way. Uh, and he said, just opt out. And I talked to legislators and they said, just opt out. It's so easy. Why don't they do it? Why don't they raise taxes? Why don't they send us more money? It's too easy for them. It's not so easy for you guys. I, of course, uh, support fully funding these operations and not uh, uh, shorting our citizens of the services they need. Thank you. Any additional public comment? All right, turn it over to the Commission for Action. Susan, did you have something? I did, I have another slide I just wanted to share before we move on. This is the scenario that Commissioner Blindberg asked to see. So this is the one and a half million. That one and a half million dollar variance on opt out, if you were to pass, it doesn't necessarily Per, um, show very clearly on the slide just because it's just moving this line slightly down in that uh, capacity for 2025. But what I wanted to um, kind of discuss with you is, you know, we have just dis um, discussed previously that 2024 financials are trending favorable for revenue, um, primarily related to interest income. So let's say, in theory, we had an additional million dollars of interest income coming in. Um, and maybe we wouldn't need to levy all of that, what this forecast, the previous forecast showed. What would that look like? Um, so in this scenario, what I did is I dropped that opt out um, that you would consider to million and a half. I, I 
increase cash applied in 2026, using that extra million in 2026 and bringing that forward. What that does is it, it doesn't change the total number of what your opt-outs are needing by the end. It just changes a couple of years. Uh, and, and I kept this pretty simple. You could, in theory, take that extra million of, of revenue that we brought in and layer it over three years. I just kept it pretty simple and showing that all in 2026. The ending result for opt-out needs on the forecast stays the same at the total amount of what you would need to consider by 2029. It's just that one year, maybe we wouldn't levy as much. Um, does that help explain that a little bit? It helps me. Thank you for the work that you put into that. Um, it does, I'm not sure I quite understand how we end up at the same. When I was looking it over, I was hoping that you could help me understand that. Um, but it... Right, so that one, let's say that $1 million of additional interest income, we would spend that and draw that down and maybe not opt out in as much in 2026. Um, but because maybe that revenue isn't going to be an ongoing revenue stream, you use it and then it's done. And so you still have to replace that need the next year with some additional revenue source. So as interest rates come down, you still have to make it up somewhere. Um, and so if we use that million to cover in an expense that's needed for public safety, our only avenue is opt out if that, that need is still there. Does that help? It does. Okay. I really appreciate it. Thank you. We did have, a, I did receive a question that Equalization had received this week, um, like what would a $2.5 million opt out do for a person's tax bill if that were to be levied? And what we are discussing right now is passing an opt out but not levying it right away. Um, but if that $2.5 million were to be levied, it results in about $0.10 cents increase per 1000 So $10 per 100000 um, would be the increase, or if you have a $300,000 home, that would result in about a $30 increase. When levied. When levied. Yeah. So passing it and not levying it um, would have no impact, but at the point that it would be levied down the road, um, that was the question that I had received is, what would that impact be if it were to be levied? So you, 10 cents per 1,000. But at this time, um, and as you can tell here, um, we are not recommending any new opt-out be levied in 2025 budget. Other questions? Commissioner Bender. And is it fair to say that if we hadn't been using the ARPA money for the last few years that's been available, we would have had to levy before now? Correct. We would have had to increase taxes before today. Correct. Um, the the uh, the benefit of the ARPA dollars is we were able to do have some services covered, but as those dollars have run out or will be running out, and we've been planning for that, um, we've been able to delay that impact to the taxpayers for a few years. Thank you, Commissioner Beninga. Uh, I'm sure there. Are we probably have talked about this n numerous times and people just look at their tax bill, but this is just the small part of the tax bill that, that people pay on property taxes. We have to add the city and the schools, which is the majority of the increase in taxes. Um, just generally speaking, we are trying to keep up with a budget that's probably 70% uh, personnel uh, to keep up with that particular HR responsibility, plus the fact that 85 to 90 percent of what we do as a group is required by the legislature to, frankly, mandate what we're responsible for. And the other piece of that is the majority of, frankly, what we're seeing forever is a dramatic growth in public safety related issues. Um, we're limited to three and a half percent, but we've had more than three and a half percent growth over many years about the need for keeping up with public safety responsibilities. So in the long range, if we don't do this, we're gonna have a cash flow problem because we're already using about eight and a half percent to 10% in our budgeting. 
of cash that is in a reserve that frankly will dry up. So I don't know that we have an option. We're opting out for this option to maintain current services. Mr. Chair, um, my commentary just to, to go forward on, I think we've had some good work from the fan committee and trying to go through a couple elements of maybe what they would be guiding us here. I think maybe we've mentioned we, we try to stay one step ahead. I, I remember another element, uh, so one step ahead, meaning opting out before we need it, kind of staying one year ahead in the budgeting process. So I think this is a very healthy outlook to look out five years and have a plan for that. Um, another element I think that we got uh, from some of those members was to potentially ladder those uh, opt-outs over time too. Um, so if we did 1.5 million last year, maybe we do some increment above that this year just to kind of build into our opt-out uh, flow for predictability, mapping out what that is in the future. So maybe that's the case for going above 1.5. Um, but the other, to go back a year, if you'll recall, the 1.5 we did then, uh, I think we had, and um, we can correct if my recollection was incorrect, but I think we, we put that in place thinking we were going to need to use it because of the UC3 expansion. And so basically we just got lucky that public safety didn't need us to levy it this time. So we kind of just got a little bit of a free pass here. But I think just all of that, those factors are combining to me to say maybe maybe the number we can debate between 1.5 and 2.5, maybe there's some sweet spot or there's something, but I'm definitely in favor of, of doing something to get us down this five-year trajectory. And whether it's 1.5 or 2.5, I think we're, we're in a, a good ballpark there, but interested in what other colleagues have. The only comment I'd have is that I, I could hear some public safety people cringing when you said we got lucky. Yeah. Um, and I would say that that luck was hard earned by folks that were working really hard and creatively to try to, um, you know, to make sure we only have in jail the folks that are a danger to society and that the other folks that may owe a, owe a debt to society are able to pay that back in other ways. So that would be my only comment. All right, so I guess my... So we do have a resolution um, for you to consider. Um, if you opted to change any of the dollar amounts or the term within this, we certainly can do this. This is um, written at this point of a $2.5 million opt-out um, that would be available for levying with calendar year 2024 taxes payable in 2025, and that the term on this opt-out would run for 25 years through taxes paid um, taxes payable in 2049. Um, both the dollar amount and that term um, can be modified today if you guys would like to do something different. We are required to have a term on our opt-outs, but I believe it can be considerably longer than 25 years. Historically, we have, since that requirement to have a term on an opt-out, we have been using 25 years, so that's why this was drafted as such. So <clears throat> I'm in favor of the 2.5 million and um, the 25 years, when you look at our budget, we have several things going on. We are using cash at a higher level than we historically have ever done. And when you look at that opt-out, whether if it's 1.5 million now, it'll probably have to be instead of 3.5 million in 2027 or six or whatever, it just has to be 4.5. I mean, it's just getting bigger. In 2049, I guess by, laddering in our opt-outs um, we're giving future commissions and in 2049 I'm pretty sure I won't be here Commissioner Benega may still be but uh, <laughs> I mean those are decisions I mean this that opt-out money is an index I mean having a 25-year window on it but it, it gives future commissions the ability then to look at their budget as we are looking at ours saying okay this opt-out's falling off and we got to consider this one falling off and it just makes it more palatable as far as numbers go instead of saying oh boy we're gonna have to take that big bite in three years let's just kick the can down the road I'd rather be thinking further down the road and saying okay what's it gonna look like in 25 years when this one's coming off instead of a huge one coming off it's a smaller one so I'm in favor of 2.5 in the 25 years
I would say I'm in favor of it as well. I mean, in favor of it in the sense that I think we have to do it, not that, I mean, this is probably my least favorite thing to do as a commissioner is to vote for an opt-out. I'm a taxpayer too, and I don't like paying more taxes either. Um, but I do think people um, value the services that the county provides, and I don't ever hear anybody asking for a lower level of services or to, um, provide less law enforcement or less public safety. So I, I do think that this is the right thing for us to do. I would agree with the comments that were made, except for me being here in 2049. <laughs> uh, I don't think we have much choice. Uh, this is, there's no way you can not look at the numbers and even thinking about 25 years from now, we're not even that's not even a possibility. It's tough to look at even three to five years down the road the way things have changed. So uh, I would be supportive of the two and a half for now. I would agree. And um, just again to make a comment about the fan and the work of the auditor's office um, with the planning that that has been put in place from the auditor's office and with the recommendations from the fan, I think this ARPA money going away could have created um, a much more difficult situation, but by planning ahead and, and using our resources, I think we're um, doing a service to the public, to our, to our citizens. Need a motion. I would make a motion to approve the resolution as printed. I'll second. Motion and a second. No further discussion. Please call the roll. Benega? Aye. Thunder? Aye. Blindberg? Aye. Kipley? Aye. Karski? Aye. Motion carries. We are now at the opportunity for public comment. We board everybody out of the room. I don't think anybody's here for public comments. <laughs> even, even Jeff Barth left. All right. <laughs> uh, commission liaison reports. Mr. Chair, I'd make one note from our last planning and zoning. Um, my days blend together. When was that last meeting? I guess the last Monday in June. We had one item that was a conditional use permit uh, to put a produce stand on A1 agricultural property that's abutting some residential property. So valid arguments on both sides of that, but that's getting appealed to the joint city county and I would just encourage my colleagues to maybe go back and watch the, the snippet of that. There's, it was on the consent calendar. It's one of those classic consent calendar items that's more complicated when you get the neighbors and some feedback on both sides. Uh, on the county side, we voted in favor of it and the city had uh, one uh, no vote. Uh, so it was approved, but now appealed. So I just uh, ask you to maybe look at that one ahead of time because it's just got some complexities to it. But other than that, I, th I don't have any other reports. Alrighty. Commissioner Blyenberg. A week from Thursday on July 11 is uh, the community engagement block party at Meldrum Park. Um, so again, just getting that word out if um, anybody's interested in helping. I know they always love to have volunteers um, and also a great experience for those in that neighborhood. All right. I personally had a couple of meetings last week, a link board meeting was Wednesday morning, 10.30 to 11.45. Um, really no big action was taken by that. Um, just routine business, a lot of discussion. Um, immediately after that was a Chamber of Commerce board meeting. Um, again, I should have taken better notes, but it, nothing comes to mind of any significant action or activity going on, but I did represent the commission at both those events as well as the Sioux Metro Growth Alliance had a membership meeting, kind of a mixer in Hartford from four to six last Wednesday. So Wednesday was busy. So, all right. Um, moving on to non-action commission discussion. We do have one item. Meredith, are you want to kind of fill us in on what's going on? Yeah, so um, the city of Sioux Falls has invited us to um, an informal meeting just to discuss some legislative priorities. And so they asked that two county commissioners um, join us there. And they've 
given us a couple of different times to attend. So um, one of the times was during a commission meeting, so that will not work. Um, but either Monday, July 15th, any time between 1 to 5, or um, that Wednesday, July 17th, any time. So if there are two commissioners that would um, be able to attend. So I've been involved in the legislative stuff mostly for the past several years. I, if Unless we have two commissioners that are wanting to jump in on it, it's just working with the city and the municipal league and kind of, you know, dovetailing our legislative priorities uh, or agendas, so to speak, and make sure that you know, what we want doesn't con conflict drastically with what they want and so on and so forth. So legislators are present and um, just kind of an informal meeting to talk about what could happen legislatively come January. So looking for a volunteer or two. I would volunteer um, with the one exception that Commissioner Beninga and I are going to be out of town, I think, for the NACO conference on the 15th still. Um, so if that's the chosen date, I would opt out. So the 17th or Thursday would be the one. Uh, oh, Wednesday. Wednesday the 17th is an option so we can let them know that that's the preferred date okay Commissioner Blyenberg and I will um, can make the 17th great thank you Alrighty. okay any other non-action Commission discussion no executive session um, so look for a motion to adjourn so moved second all those in favor say aye aye, aye. opposed same sign Stick around to sign things, I guess, right?